Thank you so much for that singing. We're going to go to the Lord uh, in prayer. I'm going to ask Brother Ryan, would you pray for us tonight? Amen. You can be seated. I'll go over our announcements as soon as I, I get it open to them. Amen. Uh, we have a junior activity coming up on May the 22nd. That'll be, they're having a movie night in the downstairs building. Uh, that'll start at 530. Uh, the cost is $3 uh, per junior and there is a sign up sheet for that. Uh, then on May the 23rd, uh, that Sunday evening after our evening service, the teens are having a destination unknown uh, activity, and all that we know about it is that you're supposed to bring money. Uh, so if you're a parent, guardian of a teenager, uh, make note of that. Uh, and then on May the 30th, we're having a teen service where they'll be, uh, the youth department will be doing the, the entirety of our evening service there, and uh, then there will be a fundraiser meal directly after that. Uh, they'll be raising uh, money to go on their missions trip to, uh, to Erie, Pennsylvania this summer to help uh, Brother Daryl Grimes. Uh, June the, uh, the 6th, uh, we have a King's Daughters meeting. June the 11th is our annual chicken plate sale, again to help raise money for uh, the missions trip, the teen missions trip. June the 26th is the Women on a Journey conference. Uh, again, there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer for that. We do hope that you're uh, setting aside that time uh, for you ladies and then uh, inviting folks as well. Uh, junior camp is uh, uh, June the 28th through July the 2nd. Vacation Bible School is Monday through Thursday, which uh, July the 26th through the 29th. And then uh, July the, oh, that one's out of order. July the 5th through the 12th is the uh, missions trip. Uh, a lot of events coming up. Excited about that. When, when we come out of a year where we had to cancel a lot of things, uh, we're excited to be able to have uh, these uh, different kind of trips planned for the kids and activities and all those kind of things. And so uh, praise the Lord for it. Uh, at this time, we'll ask Brother Mark if he'll come up. He's going to share with us our missions in a spotlight uh, this evening. And then directly after that, Brother Sam's going to share something with us, uh, a missions burden as well. All right, thank you. Um, real brief, um, we're going to look at Living Hope Free Will Baptist it's in uh, Skokie, Illinois. And I sent Brother Daniel Mann um, a message yesterday, and he sent this back to me. Uh, he says, we have a 20-year-old college student named JJ who will be getting baptized join and joining our church at the end of May. He says, it's been an, uh, incredible to watch the Lord work in his life his mom and stepdad, stepdad are committed members of our church, and God has used their testimony to bring him to Christ. Uh, that's why, obviously, it's so important that we as adults and we as mom and dad are the example we need to be uh, for, for them. It says, uh, we, all, we also have several first-time guests come to our church uh, and return in recent weeks. Uh, this is huge for us because our state, of course, Chicago, you can imagine, the state of Illinois and Chicago itself, uh, it's been locked down. Uh, it says it's been very slow to reopen. Uh, these are our first guests we've had in over a year. Uh, before, uh, and before COVID, uh, we would have guests frequently. Uh, with the lockdown, people were not attending church, especially if it was a new church. He also says, pray for uh, Mervin. It's a guy that in his late 50s who will hopefully be starting a six-week Bible study uh, through the Gospel of Mark. Uh, and he's going to be uh, doing that with a gentleman in the church. And then it goes on, it says, also be praying for Alexandra uh, and S Salbury, uh, or Selbury, I'm sorry, uh, who just started attending, and his wife, uh, Miss Mann, will be uh, meeting with them and starting also that six-week Bible study. So be in prayer for that. Uh, be in prayer for the church itself there uh, in Skokie, uh, Illinois. Also, uh, maybe most of you seen it tonight. Uh, as far as uh, Brother Daryl Grimes, be in prayer for him. Be in prayer for Charity. Um, I think she's back in the hospital again, and uh, and he's struggling. There, I mean, obviously, it's it's pretty hard on him. So, be in prayer for uh, them as well. Thank you.
I want to tell you about an investment opportunity of a lifetime. The best return you'll ever get, absolutely guaranteed. Uh, and I do have a little bit of information on insider trading, and it's not illegal. It is not illegal, I promise you. I spoke with Dr. Wayne Johnson this afternoon, and through some of his mission work, uh, they have 18 mission families, indigenous families from Venezuela that come out of the church in Venezuela, and they have gone through their uh, institution, and they have taught them how to build a church. Uh, this is the second time they've done it. Last year, they taught 18, no, uh, they taught uh, 15 families, their family units, husband and wives and children. They go back, last year they taught 15, 10 of them, or no, three years ago this was, uh, 10 of them became self-supporting the first two years they were back. Uh, this, they guarantee two years of support at $125 per family two years commitment at $125 per family. That's all the support they get, and they support them for two years. If they are not self-supporting in two years, then they will offer to retrain them one time and send them back for another two years. If they're not self-supporting then, they cut them loose. They don't feel like God's in it, so uh, they no longer support them, and they start teaching someone else. But right now, they have 18 families that they're looking support for. Uh, seven of them has already been committed to different, uh, to other people. So that leaves, what, uh, six more families. No, yeah, six more families uh, at $125 per month per family. Uh, one of the greatest opportunities for mission investments that you can possibly do. And it's one of the greatest blessings you'll ever get. Uh, you'll have to wait for your return for a little while, but I guarantee you it's there. Uh, you'll never know the many, many faces that you'll meet in heaven because of mission work that goes on around the world that where these dollars go to. And they'll be able to come up and thank you for it one day. And better than that, the Lord will. Uh, but this is good work. Uh, all of you know Dr. Johnson. Uh, excellent. It's solid. And uh, the work is there and the need's there. Uh, so I think that we need to support it. Uh, but just talk with the pastor afterwards. It's up to him which way we send mission money. So that will be his decision. But I want you to know about this. And it's excellent, excellent work. But the timing is now, and they need to know so they can get these people to the mission field within the next three weeks. Thank you. Take your Bibles, open them up to the book of Luke, chapter number 13. Luke, chapter 13. The parable that we're going to be looking at this evening in Luke 13 uh, is actually uh, just verses 6 through 9. Uh, but I wanted to start off by giving a little bit of background to why the Lord Jesus uh, gave uh, this parable at this specific time, uh, Luke chapter 13, verse 1, tells us, or we can see uh, that there were people that were there at the place where Jesus was, where he was ministering and teaching, that felt that it was important to vocalize a very horrible situation, a massacre that had, uh, that had taken place. And we'll look at that in just a second. Uh, but uh, what all that, that means, I want to read verse 1 first. It says, there were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifice. There were a group of Galileans that were making a sacrifice at this time, obviously, uh, and Pilate ordered that they be put to death immediately. Uh, as they were making this sacrifice, they were all put to death. There's not a whole lot of uh, historical uh, record of this uh, specific instance, uh, but as they were making this sacrifice, they were executed. Uh, we're not given an exact reason as to why they were brought 
uh, uh, why uh, this was brought up at this specific moment or why they were killed. And uh, we're not giving all, all the details on that. Uh, some think that the reason that these, uh, these men brought this up to Jesus, uh, that they mentioned it to him, was because of some, uh, they wanted to give Jesus a warning, uh, uh, or, or I'm sorry, because of the warnings that Jesus gave in the previous chapters uh, about uh, getting right with each other. If there's a problem, get it right with one another uh, before it gets out of control and uh, you end up being taken into custody, going before a judge, uh, and possibly even incarcerated over a matter that could have and should have been dealt with man to man. So get things right with one another. If you have a disagreement before you have to go uh, before a judge who has really no, uh, no uh, dog in the fight, so to speak, and has to pass judgment. Jesus talked about that at the end of chapter 12. The idea uh, in all of this is that, uh, that they were saying, uh, as far as the people thinking that maybe this is the reason they brought it up, uh, it, it gives the idea of they were saying, uh, agreeing with Jesus uh, and saying, see, this is, uh, this is what happened as far as those that were killed during that sacrifice, this is what happened because they didn't do things the way Jesus said for us to do. So some believe that it was for the purpose of backing up words that Jesus had said. Some believe that they were trying to warn, Je warn Jesus concerning the brutality of Pilate as he was going uh, in his direction. And we know what took place as a result uh, in Jesus' crucifixion. Uh, some believe they were trying to warn him. Uh, some believe that it was just an opportunity for the self-righteous to express the deep or the depth of depravity that the Galileans had uh, and how great uh, uh, the, how they, uh, God had judged them in such a great way because of their sin. Uh, this, uh, um, it's almost as if they were saying, uh, comparing themselves uh, and saying my sin or our sins aren't as bad as the Galileans because look they were in the midst of making sacrifice and uh, while they were making sacrifice they were come uh, uh, the uh, pilot and his uh, uh, forces if you will came on them and killed every one of them and uh, this this seems to be the one that carries a bit more validity due to Jesus's response either way uh, that we want to believe, uh, whatever it is we want to believe as the reason why it was brought up. Uh, they brought up this massacre and Jesus used it as an opportunity to correct the thinking of those that were gathered there. And that's where we pick up in verse 2 and it says, And Jesus uh, answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all Galileans because they suffered such things. Do you think that they were the worst of all of the Galileans, the worst of all sinners, and that's why they suffered in this way? He says, I tell you nay, but except ye repent. You see how Jesus just turned the tables and gave them a, a, a hit right between the eyes concerning their own sin and their own eternal destination. He says, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. We're not promised tomorrow uh, we're not promised another breath. We're not promised that we won't suffer uh, in, a, in a great way. And uh, Jesus is saying, look, you need to make sure that everything between you and God is what it ought to be. Quit worrying about others and uh, thinking about the sins of the Galileans. Uh, verse 4, uh, or those 18 upon whom the tower of Siloam uh, fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelled in Jerusalem. Do you, do you think that the fact that this tower fell on them uh, was a direct uh, result of God judging them for their sin because they were the worst of all the sinners that were in Jerusalem? He says, I tell you nay again, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Jesus' message to them was this. First of all, don't compare yourself with others. Who is it we're supposed to compare ourselves with? Who is our example uh, for, uh, for the Christian faith or who and what we are supposed to be? Jesus. 
Uh, does it do you any good to compare yourself with, uh, with your Sunday school teacher, with the deacons of the church? Does it do you any good to compare yourself uh, with the pastor? Or does it do you any good to compare yourself with some of the greatest uh, godly men that ever walked the face of this earth? It does us no good to compare ourselves and, and try to justify our wrongdoing when the reality is there's only one that fits the bill of a worthy standard by which we should live our life, and that is Jesus. Jesus Christ himself. So anytime that we have a desire to compare ourselves with others uh, concerning our sin, you know, uh, they were judged because they were, uh, they were so sinful. And you see that in, in Job's friends as he was going through all those trials. They said, look, man, obviously you need to repent of some things. And Job says, you guys are just miserable comforters. Uh, it wasn't his sin that was causing that to go on, although because he was sinful, he deserved it just like all of us do. Uh, but it was, uh, it, God had a different plan and a different purpose and a different reason behind it. It's not always uh, sin that causes us to go through hardship. Sometimes just being alive means that we're going to go through hardship. And the longer that we live, the more we know that that hardship is coming. He says, don't compare yourself to others. Don't worry about the, uh, the depth and the, uh, the enormity of the sin that they had. Con uh, be concerned about yourself. You have enough to focus on. He also is teaching all sin will one day be judged. Repent. You need to repent. You need to take care of things. You need to make sure uh, that you are uh, ready to meet the Lord. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. One day... All sin will be judged. If your sin isn't taken care of uh, by the, uh, the precious gift and the shed blood of Jesus Christ in this New Testament church age, if our sins haven't been addressed and haven't been paid for and uh, atoned for, if our sins aren't taken care of and forgiven, we will be judged. Now, as we go through this life, we still reap what we sow. We sow to the flesh, we'll reap to the flesh. And if, if we do wrong, if we sin, then uh, in this life, it's going to cost us. There's consequence to sin. But in eternity, I don't have to worry about how sorry of a person I was because that's been taken care of. That's been forgiven. I've been redeemed. I've been, uh, I'm under the, uh, my sins and my life are under the blood of Jesus. And his righteousness is now uh, the righteousness that I get to claim. All sin will one day be judged. Don't worry about what everybody else has done in the depth of their sin. Worry about yourself. He says, your day of judgment is coming. Repent. Or in the same way that they died, suddenly you will die. His message is repent while you have a chance. Isn't it awesome how... As Jesus is giving them this, and, and understand some of those that were there, some of them, uh, again, we've looked at it in the past, these aren't all uh, sold out disciples. There are some that are there just to see what they can get out of the situation. There are some that are following him because of miracles and provisions, uh, and that's the only reason they're following after him. That's why every time uh, the, the crowd is mentioned throughout the ministry of Jesus, it tends to dwindle smaller and smaller and smaller uh, because he doesn't pull any punches with them. He tells them how it is. Uh, but uh, they're not all right in the eyes of God, and uh, he's getting them to understand uh, that their sin will one day be judged and that, that they don't repent of their sin, that they too uh, will suffer the, the judgment of God. You don't compare yourself to others uh, or any of those things. You simply uh, focus on getting your heart and your life right with God. The reality is all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He draws their attention to that. And he, when he says that you will likewise perish uh, because you are a sinner, uh, he draws their attention to that. But he gives them this word uh, of repentance while they still can. I'm thankful that we have a God who will point out our sins, show us our shortcoming, and instead of judging us right there on the spot, gives us opportunity of getting it right. That is a merciful and a gracious God, one who is worthy of our praise. And so as we see him uh, offering this repentance, uh, while you still have the chance... 
This is when Jesus takes the opportunity to speak this parable. Now, this parable, we can see that it, it aligns with, uh, with the expanse of time concerning the children of Israel, their people of God, and uh, the day in which uh, they live, and, and I would say in the day in which we live as well, and we'll see that in a second. But it also can be drawn a little bit closer to, uh, well, let me read what I have. Uh, let me read through these verses, and then I'll uh, go over that. Uh, starting in Luke uh, 13, starting in verse number 6. And he spake in this parable, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I came seeking fruit on this fig tree, this fig tree, and found none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answered, the, the dresser of the vineyard answered and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. In Scripture, God often uses both the vineyard and the fig tree to make reference to his people. In these depictions, there is a continual theme of the vineyard and the fig tree being required or expected to produce fruit. That's the purpose of the vineyard and the fig tree is to produce fruit. In the Old Testament, this depiction refers to the children of Israel, God's chosen people. And we'll look at a reference to that in just a second. In the New Testament here, uh, it is also, uh, along with uh, the children of Israel, chosen people of God, it is also used to represent the church or the body of Christ and the individual Christian as well. So this message is, a, is applicable to us. I think we can see all three are easily seen in this short parable. And with, uh, uh, with that being said, I want to look at a parallel uh, passage to this uh, parable uh, that's in the Old Testament. Turn to Isaiah chapter number 5. And as we look at how uh, this parable uh, starts off, in response to God, uh, uh, or, or uh, in God's response to what it is that he sees is what I meant to say. Isaiah chapter number 5, uh, Old Testament uh, uh, give a, uh, giving of a very similar story in reference to, to God's people, the children of Israel. Isaiah chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard, my well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a winepress therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. Useful grapes for the, the, um, the owner's purpose, and it brought forth unuseful grapes. Verse number three. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought forth wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to, the, uh, to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the walls thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also 
command the clouds that they rain not upon it, that no rain uh, upon it. Uh, remember, this is in reference to God Almighty. So he has the ability to tell the clouds, don't rain on it. Uh, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah, the, the people of God, the children of Israel, chosen people of God. He tells us here, that's what this represents. Uh, um, uh, and the men of Judah, his, uh, his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment or justice or right kind of living or he, he looked for what they should be doing, but he beheld oppression. He looked for righteousness, but behold, a cry. In Isaiah, we see the Lord uh, making reference uh, uh, to uh, the, his, uh, his people and uh, how he uh, had done all these things for it to make sure that they were in the position and place of prosperity. And we'll look at all that again later. Uh, but he says that uh, the Lord uh, did all these things and yet it didn't produce anything but wild grapes, unuseful grapes. And uh, the result of it was that he judged. He says, I looked and didn't find what I was looking for. But instead, I found something else. Doesn't that go along with the parable uh, that we looked at? As the children of God, he says, look, uh, as far as the, the Lord is concerned, or uh, as far as your life is concerned, um, there was a certain man who planted a vineyard and uh, came and sought the fruit of it and didn't find any. And he told the vineyard, uh, the dresser of the vineyard, look, I've come year after year after year seeking after this fruit, and this specific tree has given me nothing. He says, therefore, I want you to cut it down. It is, uh, why cumbereth it the land? Why, it is taking up space. It's a waste of space. We're, we're, as we're going to look at next week, the dresser of the vineyard being a picture of Christ makes intercession for that tree. Amen? Amen. I could preach on that one verse all night, but I won't. Amen. Um, he says, look, if let me for a year dress it, dig around it and dung it or, or give, give fertilizer to it. Let me, uh, let me nurture it. Let me do everything that I can to, to, to help it to produce fruit. And at the end of that time, when you come back to, uh, to seek fruit, if it has no fruit, then you can tear it down. As we look at verses 6 and 7, uh, verse 6, we see, uh, we see the inspection with judgment. As this applies to, uh, to the children of Israel, the, the Jew, but it also applies to the, to the church and the individual, uh, we look at what happens here, uh, the inspection with judgment. A certain man had a, a fig tree planted in his vineyard. This certain man is a, uh, this is a, uh, a picture of Almighty God, and it's a picture of him uh, making provision and uh, planning that plan. And so uh, we see that uh, as this man represents God, we see God's claim over this vineyard, over the, the tree itself. Uh, it is God's, uh, the, the way that it's uh, laid out for us, this is God's property. This is uh, God's vineyard. This is uh, God's tree. It's God's work that went into uh, to having this tree planted here in this vineyard. That in and of itself is kind of interesting because uh, this great vineyard, this uh, place where uh, grapes or, or uh, fruit of the vine, a place that was uh, beautiful and manicured and kept, it says that uh, in the midst of all of that, God plant planted a fig tree. That fig tree had a specific purpose. God had a specific plan for that and a specific use for that, that uh, as God is represented as this man who planted. Uh, so we see God's claim over all of this. He had a, a vineyard. He planted the tree. The tree belongs to him and everything in it, including the fruit. So he has claimed as God goes and inspects and as God goes and uh, uh, is looking for this fruit and we'll see his expectation in a second, God has every right to expect that because it belongs to him. And because he planted it there, it was his work that allowed it to be there. He was the one that made provision for it. So God has every right 
uh, to what it is that he is going to expect. We see that as this man goes to the, the fig tree that's been planted in the vineyard, he sought thereon and found none. What was the man's expectation? Or uh, as we draw to us, us being the, uh, the tree and the, uh, the vineyard maybe being, uh, being the church, God having a plan and a purpose for us and uh, putting us here and giving us the responsibility of uh, ministering in our time and worshiping him. As God comes and he has paid for our life, he has done everything necessary for, uh, for us to be, uh, be forgiven and to be useful as God has done all of these things. He has claim over us, right? Wherefore, we are bought with a price. Uh, we should glorify God with our body because of that. We are not our own. We belong to him. Uh, so he has claim over us. And his expectation is no different than the man's expectation as he approaches a tree. He expects fruit. The fruit of the Spirit, we know those, right? We know that God expects us as his children to bear fruit. That is, the, that is the natural thing as a child of God. Uh, the natural response to becoming a child of God is to bear the fruit that God has intended for us to bear. God's expectation out of each and every one of us is fruit, fruitful living, fruitful uh, Christianity, uh, reaching and serving and doing. As I thought about the, uh, the application of this uh, fruit and what, uh, what, it is that it, what it is that it would provide for this certain man that planted the tree and expected the fruit, I thought of three things that, that this fruit would have done. Fruit would satisfy hunger. For a natural man, fruit brings or is nourishment for their life. And not just that, fruit is refreshing. How can we see this applying to God and his expectation out of me as one of his children to produce fruit? Well, the fact that fruit is satisfying, we should be satisfying his requirements of righteousness. Be ye holy, for I am holy. We should be satisfying uh, his requirement out of humanity for righteousness. That's one way uh, that, that we produce fruit. We should be satisfying God's desire for fellowship with humanity. Didn't God create us for fellowship with him? Didn't he create us in his image and uh, give us a free will? Uh, uh, we know those things. Uh, he breathed into us light. He shaped, he shaped each and every one of us. He has created humanity as a crowning glory uh, of all of his creation. His desire was to spend time in the, in the garden with Adam and as he created Eve to spend time with her. It was God's desire and it always has been to have fellowship with humanity. We should be satisfying that desire of his. I say should be because when we harbor sin in our own heart and our own life and we're not the righteous individuals that we're supposed to be, we don't have fellowship with God. We should be satisfying his desire for relationship or fellowship. We should be satisfying his requirements of righteousness. Does he not deserve those things? We should be satisfying his call to service. He says, I want you to go. I want you to tell. I want you to do. I want you to live it before the lost. I want you to compel them to come and uh, bring them to the house of God and bring them to the foot of the cross and uh, instill in them the truths of God's word. That's what Jesus tells us to do in his great commission. And we should be satisfying his call for service. We should be satisfying his worthiness of worship. Fruit is satisfying to the natural man and fruit in the life of a Christian is satisfying to God. Fruit is also nourishing. That nourishment bringing us strength, giving uh, as far as uh, uh, vitamins and nourishment in our own life and in the natural uh, body, it gives us strength, it gives us uh, durability, it keeps us from uh, being susceptible to sickness and things of that nature. Fruit is nourishing and strengthening. What is it that, how is it that that applies to us? Well, our fruit 
the fruit that we produce as children of God should strengthen his work. Shouldn't our life and the fruit that's being produced in our life and uh, the things that we are doing, the way that we carry ourselves, shouldn't that strengthen the work of God in this world? Did, did Jesus, Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost, right? He came and he died for the church. He, he, he instituted the church. He uh, established the church. He's the foundation that is built upon. He is a chief cornerstone uh, that, that it rests upon. He is, all, he is doing that work in this world for the purpose of reaching people with the, the good news of the gospel so that they won't have to spend eternity paying, for the, uh, the, the, paying the debt of their own sin. That's the work that he's doing here. He does that through missions. We've, got, we've been given a handful of different uh, missions things this evening. He does that through the local church. He does that through devoted uh, Christian families. He does, uh, his work is, is being accomplished in this world through individual Christians. Shouldn't our, uh, the fruit that we're producing, shouldn't our life be strengthening his work and not harming his work? If the life that we're living is bringing him harm, we are not fruit, we are poison. Let that sink in just for a second. If the life that we're not, or if the life that we are living is not strengthening and nourishing the work of God, we are not producing fruit, we're producing poison. We should be strengthening his work. God has given us the church to, uh, to, to be there for one another, to be that iron that sharpens iron, to be that shoulder to cry on, that hand that's supposed to, uh, to lift them up, to be that voice of reason, that voice of teaching, and that voice of instruction. Uh, so we should be strengthening God's people. But we can't get along and we allow our, our petty differences in uh, opinion and uh, differences of background to cause us to be divided. We're not strengthening or we're not fruit if we're not strengthening the people of God. Our life, we should be strengthening his church. We should be strengthening his reputation. When a self-professing child of God claims to be reborn, claims to be forgiven, claims to be right in the eyes of God and they live like the devil himself, we tarnish the reputation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We make a mockery of who and what it is that he is, of his requirement, of, uh, of his work, of his, his own personal sacrifice. The word Christian, as they were uh, called Christians first in Antioch, it was, a, uh, it was a derogatory term that those that were around him and that saw them, they say, oh, they're, they're just little Christ. When they meant it as a derogatory term, it really was a, uh, a term of accomplishment and a badge of honor that they would see their life and say they are living in a way trying to mimic their spiritual leader, so to speak. My question is, does when we call ourselves Christian, are, are we bringing shame and reproach against Christ or do we bring him glory and honor? Strength nourishes and strengthens, it satisfies. We should be strengthening his work, his people, his church, his reputation. We should be satisfying his requirements of righteousness, his desire for fellowship, his call uh, uh, to service, and uh, we should be satisfying his worthiness of worship. But fruit is also refreshing. It satisfies a hunger, right? Fruit and vegetable, it'll satisfy a hunger, even though it's not a steak. It'll still satisfy hunger. It'll also provide for us nourishment, vitamins, minerals, all those kind of things. But fruit is so much more than that. I love a good pineapple, amen? I like them grilled. I know that maybe not everybody's had grilled cinnamon-covered pineapples. It's amazing. I like them cold. I like it crushed up. I like it to flavor, uh, flavor chicken and, and other meats. Amen. 
Uh, I, I like it all different. I like pineapple juice. I like it, uh, that juice mixed with other kind of juice. I just like pineapples. I love pineapples. You can keep every banana that God has ever created, but I love pineapples. There is something refreshing about biting in on a hot day, biting in to a cold pineapple. It's refreshing. How does that apply? As a child of God, I'm to be producing fruit, not just providing uh, satisfaction to my, uh, my Lord and Savior, not just providing nourishment to, to his work, his people, his church, his, his reputation. But I should be refreshing to him. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This world in which we live is dark and rotten. Not because he created anything uh, that, that, that's uh, got a mistake or, or uh, that he's created anything that, uh, that, is, uh, that is bad in and of itself, but humanity has so perverted free will and so perverted uh, even, even the, the globe that he's given us to live upon. Uh, we have done such a, a disservice to God that we have made this place a rotten place. It's a dark place. It's a place where uh, the devil, uh, being the prince of the power of the air, you know why he has the power that he has other than the fact that God has allowed him to? It's because we have given him that power by submitting to his temptation. So uh, as we live in this dark world with this great enemy, as there's sinful people and, and uh, all sorts of uh, horrible things taking place all around us, we as God's people should be producing fruit that is refreshing to God. Something different is what I'm talking about. Something that stands out. Something uh, that they just, just quench and provide the nourishment, but it's, it's, it tastes good in the mouth. Do you get the imagery that we're going with? We should be pleasing in his sight. When he looks at our life, our dedication, our consecration, when he looks at the level of separation that we are giving towards him, as he looks at the things that we are doing, the places we are going, he should be satisfied and pleased with us. We should be pleasing in his sight. But we're not always pleasing in his sight. We should be pleasing to his sense of smell. The Bible says that our offering, it goes back into the Old Testament as, as they would make a, a sacrifice and they would burn that sacrifice and the, the smoke would ascend into heaven. It says that the, that the smell of, of that uh, burnt sacrifice is a, uh, a sweet smell in the nose of God. It applies in our New Testament church age, it applies to us any time that we go into service, any time we sacrifice our times, our talents, our treasures, any time that we uh, sacrifice who and what we are for the work of God, when we produce that sacrificial fruit, it should be a sweet-smelling savor in the nostrils of God. Our actions, our life. We should be pleasing to His touch. God causes it to rain on the just and the unjust. The Bible talks about uh, uh, that those who give will be blessed. It doesn't say those Christians that give to the work of God will be blessed. It says anybody who gives to the work of God, God will bless them. Hey, the Bible talks about let everything that has breath praise the Lord. He blesses anybody and everybody that uplifts his name. He makes it rain on the just and the unjust. God is good to everybody all the time. Not just to the child of God. God is good to everybody. The simple fact that he's given us the opportunity of repentance proves that he's good. Now, with that being said, as he uh, places a hand of blessing on our life, which amazing blessing that we heard about. And we heard about other things that have taken place, uh, the other praise item. And uh, we've heard about how God is working and God is doing great things in Venezuela. If I said it right, I don't even know. Uh, but God is blessing in a great and awesome way, right? It should be pleasing to God when he places his hand of blessing on us. Here's what we often do. We will take his blessing and consume it upon our own lust. We'll take his blessing and use it for things that we shouldn't. Uh, most of the time, that's monetary blessing. 
We use it to please ourselves. We use it. Uh, we use the job that he's given, the hours that we've been able to work, and the the amount of money we make per hour or per year, salary wise. Uh, we take all those things and uh, and we we're stingy with it, and we and we don't want to give it up. Yeah, we'll we'll give the the little bit, and uh, we'll give the bare minimum, the ten percent. And God uh, God uh, uh, has has promised that He will bless that kind of giving because because He's a good God. He'll bless someone who gives the bare minimum. But we should be pleasing in the sacrifice that we give. And uh, when he blesses our life, when he touches us, when he provides for us in an amazing and an awesome and a powerful way, it should bring him pleasure. It should be something when God uh, smells our sacrifice, when he sees our life, when he places his hand of blessing on us, uh, that this is his son in whom he is well pleased. This is one that I have died for and that has uh, taken it so serious that they've applied the realities of that to, to every aspect of their life. It's a pleasure for me to bless them. It's a pleasure uh, for me to, uh, to, to look upon them. We should be pleasing to his ears. Amen. I, I loved our service last Sunday night. Out of my comfort zone. Don't normally do that kind of thing. But we had a praise service. We can sing songs. Uh, I, I've heard it said and said it before uh, that there are more lies told behind a, a church hymnal than any other place in this world. As we sing how great God is and how we uh, surrender all and how uh, our life is laid on the altar before God and how uh, we're pleased, we're satisfied, it is well with our souls and uh, we uh, invite the reproof and uh, we uh, run from sin and all these different hymns that, that we sing about, about the amazing grace of God and yet some of us stand there and we sing those words and we don't mean a bit of it. Again, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. But our praise ought to be pleasing to his ears. From the abundance of our heart, from the overflow of his goodness and his grace and his mercy, recognizing who he is and how he's high and lifted up and who we are. And we are so unworthy in every way. He gives us opportunity. He works in our life. He makes himself uh, present. He is always there to hear us and to, uh, to heal us and to pick us up and dust us off. He is a great and an awesome God. And our voices of praise ought to be pleasing to him. And it's only pleasing if it comes from the heart. God expects fruit. Fruit is satisfying, nourishing, and refreshing. All those things God should get. But as we see our parable going on, and he came and sought fruit thereon, verse 6, and found none. As we looked in our uh, Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, it talked about the vineyard he, uh, uh, that he had a very, was placed on a very fruitful hill, the choicest of all hills. He put a fence or a hedge around this field to protect it uh, from anything coming and, uh, and destroying it. And before he planted and before he did uh, what was necessary, he took all the stones out of it to, uh, so that uh, uh, in tilling it and taking care of it, he wouldn't be encumbered in any way that there would be nothing uh, that, that would uh, uh, keep those vines uh, from producing fruit. It says that he planted the choicest of vines. He didn't just take any old vines. He went and sought out and looked for the right seed, the right kind of vine. Uh, and after he planted those choices of vines, it says that he built a tower in the midst of it. And uh, that's for the purpose of being able to go up in that tower and look around and make sure that there's no enemy that's coming at it, that there's uh, that the locusts aren't coming and that the, the frost isn't going to, uh, to, uh, to cause it to, to wither, that there's uh, no outside force that's going to cause any harm to this vineyard. He's built a tower around it. Or a tower in the midst of it. A hedge around it. Choices of vines. Took out all of the stones. He made a wine press 
so that there will be no time, uh, the wine press therein, so that there will be no time from, uh, from when they pick the, uh, the, the fruit of the vine to the time that they crush it for the purpose of making this grape juice so that it wouldn't wither or uh, it wouldn't start to rot by the time they got it to the wine press. Look, he did everything that he possibly could to make sure that this vineyard was successful. They should bring forth grapes. And when he went to look at it, to see the fruit that it was producing, all it did was produce worthless, wild grapes. Verse number four, it says, what could have been done more to my vineyard? What could I have possibly done in addition to all that I have done to ensure that that vineyard would produce fruit. Is there anything? In our parable, God being the man who had the vineyard planted the tree, as he comes to inspect or to pick the fruit of our life as a child of God, Do we leave him feeling disappointed? Yeah, we should be pleasing in his sight and pleasing for him to smell and pleasing for him to touch with blessing and pleasing to his ears. We should be strengthening his work, his people, his church, his reputation. We should be satisfying his requirements of righteousness and desire for fellowship. And uh, we should be satisfying his call to service and his worthiness of worship. But when he comes to inspect our fruit... Does he leave feeling disappointed? What is it that he's given to ensure in, in Isaiah uh, that the, uh, that the uh, vineyard would produce fruit? And what is it that he's done as he has planted it in uh, the vineyard and put the, the tree in the midst of it, a place that's already well kept, a place that's already producing fruit? What is it that he's done in our life? He has secured our protection, just like he secured the protection of the vineyard. As a child of God, I don't have to worry about the external forces. The enemy, he's a high, strong tower, a place of refuge. My shield, my sword, my strength. For the vineyard, he supplied all the provision that was needed. He says, is there anything else that I possibly could have done? He set this vineyard up for prosperity. In our life, he has secured our protection, supplied every provision that we need. He has set us up to prosper. He gives us his word. He gives us forgiveness, the assurance of forgiveness. He gives us the Holy Spirit. He gives us the church. He gives us his promise. He gives us everything that we need to be successful in this life. To be victorious, he gives us everything that we need to produce fruit. He says, what more could I have possibly done to ensure prosperity? But when I came, I was disappointed if I found no fruit. We see what he is giving. The question that we've got to ask ourselves is what is it that he's getting in return? Is he getting the fruit that he seeks? Or is he getting wild grapes or is he getting poison or no fruit at all? We're going to close here. He gives instruction for judgment. In our parable, it says, Then said he unto the dresser of the vineyard, Behold, these three years I came seeking fruit of the fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? In the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter, uh, chapter number 5 uh, 
uh, ver- starting in verse 5, he says, uh, And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, the provision of protection. Uh, and it shall be eaten up and break down the walls thereof. Again, the provision of protection, uh, provision and protection, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay waste to it and shall know uh, and it won't be pruned and uh, they won't uh, dig in it. They won't pull up the weeds, uh, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds not to rain upon it. He is cursing this ground because it's not producing fruit. Same kind of thing he's talking about in verse 7 of Luke chapter 13. The instruction for judgment is given to here. God's reasoning. First of all, I've been nothing but good. Right? God's been nothing but good to us. God has been nothing but open. Not only is he good to us, but he's open and giving us an understanding of what God requires and what it takes to be pleasing in his eyes. He even gives us the Holy Spirit in the day in which we live to to guide us in every step that we take. He's good to us. He is open to us. And he says in verse 7 that for three years he came looking for fruit. Now, it doesn't say that he planted the tree three years ago. It says three years He's been coming to this tree for the purpose of getting figs. When it should have been producing, when it should have been uh, yielding a fruit, he would come and find nothing. He would come and find nothing. He would come and find nothing. By the way, a fig tree doesn't just uh, produce fruit one time a year. It's a, it, it continually does it. It's, it does it more than once a, once a year. And so he would come looking and not find what he was looking for. For three years, this thing should have been producing fruit and it didn't produce anything. I've been nothing but open. I've been nothing but good. And I've been nothing but patient. That's God's reasoning for his instruction for judgment. And then we see his response. Cut it down cast it out and cultivate for another. It's taking up space. This isn't, I do believe with all of my heart, the possibility of apostasy. I don't think that that's what this parable is getting at. It's not God casting us out of heaven. But what we see, uh, what we see happening here is, as the fruit is supposed to uh, produce and and yield and uh, give to to the Lord and it's not producing, it's not doing what it's supposed to. It's almost as if God is shelving that Christian or putting a roadblock up in front of that specific ministry because it's not giving him the glory. It's not bringing uh, him the fruit that he deserves. It's more uh, concerned about, uh, about itself and uh, about how it looks and, and about its profit. It's not worried uh, as much as about bringing glory and honor to God. And so it's taking up space. That's kind of an interesting thought. That, that, that God would have it removed so that the ground could be cultivated so that that place, that place of protection and provision, that, that awesome place, that vineyard that's set on the choices of hills in the perfect place where it gets just the right amount of sunlight and it gets just the right amount of protection, uh, God, God is giving us the understanding that somebody else could be taking up that place. Someone who is serving, someone who is doing right, someone who is pleasing and satisfying and refreshing. God's desire is to bless the righteous. If we're not receiving that blessing, maybe it's because we're more in the way than anything else. As God's going to cut down and has a desire for the, uh, the dresser of the vineyard to come and to, uh, to cultivate the land, to cast that fig tree out of there, this is where the story here in the New Testament differs a little bit from that of the Old Testament story. There's one who makes intercession. 
God has been good, open and patient. And in every way, he has every right to cut us down, to cast us out and to give our blessings to another. But our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ says, give me another chance to work at them. Give me another chance to cultivate their heart. To do what's necessary to fertilize, to prune, to do. Maybe, it, maybe it's hard things. Maybe it's things that we don't want to go through. Uh, but the Lord Jesus Christ works in our life to make us fit to produce the fruit that God requires out of us. This evening, as we close, I want to ask the question, as we've, we've looked at how uh, he is deserving in every way, he has uh, every uh, claim of our life, he, has, uh, he is right in his expectation that his children should be producing fruit. The question I have, is God disappointed when he comes and makes inspection? How is it God's going to respond to what it is we're producing or not producing at all?